The committee will come to order. The Oversight Committee exists to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Today, <coughs> a debate is unfolding uh, in America that comes down to two fundamental questions about how much government do we need in our lives. From this side of Capitol Hill all the way to Pennsylvania Avenue, there are hearings every day and listening sessions every day about the creation of jobs. Today we are going to listen about whether or not a tsunami of regulations, some well-intended, some expedited, some perhaps in conflict with each other, are creating an environment in which the economic downturn will be prolonged. On one hand, the Obama administration has been stubborn in, de in its determination to issue costly regulations and paid little regard to the impact that these mandates will have on the broader economy. On the other hand, the administration has admitted that there are at least 500 regulations that need to be withdrawn. They have talked in terms of duplicate regulations. They have talked in terms of relieving regulatory burdens on job creators so much so that the Gallup poll of job creators, of in entrepreneurs, considers the number one impediment to job creation to be, in fact, regulatory excess. Today we are going to hear about Utility MAC, the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA's proposed uh, issue of this rule, which is clearly by its own terms an $11 billion rule but, in fact, by most of the people on both sides of the aisle who are looking at the high end of what it could cost being ten times that or more. Anything which causes the price of energy and its availability to suddenly change will disrupt markets, will change the balance of cost effectiveness here in America, because, after all, if you increase the price of an essential fuel like electricity, you will, by definition, increase the cost of doing business, and particularly for manufacturing jobs which often depend on high volume of electricity in order to create efficiencies to offset advantages third world countries have in less expensive labor. Whether you are in Florida or, as our first witness today, Virginia, whether you are a donor of the fuel of, of greatest choice, that being coal, or, in fact, you are a recipient of that to power your power plants, you know that, in fact, the grid depends at least 51 percent on reliable power that today comes from coal. We applaud the EPA for continuing a tradition to try to find ways to continually clean up all of our energy sources, to reduce particulates, and particularly to set a standard for reducing mercury. We have no objections to the attempt to, on an ongoing basis, increase the reliability of our power plants to deliver clean energy. At the same time, 24 attorneys generals, both Democrats and Republicans, have requested the EPA to, to postpone issuance of its rule for one year. Today, we will hear from one of those attorney generals, along with the EPA, and a think tank individual, giving three different views from three different perspectives. This is not the last hearing we will have on the speed with which we can make air and water cleaner and the cost that it will have. In no case do we want anyone to misunderstand. If this rule does not take place, air and water will be as clean tomorrow as it is today. If this rule takes place a year from now and it is different and better 
it will only increase the cleanliness and the reliability that comes with good, clean energy here in America. The goal today is to hear, is this the right time? Is this the right speed? Is the science ready? And most importantly, what will be the impact to the various states? And with that, I would like to recognize the ranking member for his opening statement. Mr. Chairman, I yield to the gentleman from uh, Virginia, Ms. Connolly. I thank the ranking member. It is a shame that uh, the committee majority shows so little interest in legislation that might promote technological innovation and improve management of Federal information technology. Instead, we are conducting another partisan hearing that isn't really related to our committee's primary jurisdiction. Now the committee is holding a hearing to attack common sense EPA limits on mercury, arsenic, dioxin, and other pollution. Consider the pressing technology-related topics in which this committee has not held a hearing. Cloud computing, data center consolidation, an update to FISMA, implementation of the Chief Information Officer's 25-point plan, or improvements to the acquisition workforce. We have not held hearings on filling the gaping holes in our acquisition workforce or about how to improve training for acquisition personnel. We have held markups of the legislation to create new unfunded mandates and private sector regulations, the Data Act, but not on legislation to streamline or expedite data center consolidation or the shift to cloud-based data storage and processing. Under Republican leadership, this committee has abandoned the most important issues in Federal technology and management issues, which are of vital importance to one of the most important job-creating sectors of our economy, technology. Instead of focusing on these important topics, the committee majority has decided to attack limits on mercury and other toxic pollution. The EPA is updating standards to regulate toxic mercury pollution because the courts found that a prior rule issued under the Bush administration on behalf of the polluters violated law. Under the Obama administration, the EPA actually is trying to do its job and reduce toxic pollution as Congress directed in 1990. As the EPA attempts to administer the Clean Air Act, it is worth recalling that the Clean Air Act used to have bipartisan support. It was signed into law by a Republican president 40 years ago and strengthened substantially by a Republican president in 1990. By any empirical measure, the Clean Air Act is a wild success. It saves 160,000 lives annually by preventing deaths that would otherwise be caused by air pollution. Major regulations implemented under the Clear Act have saved more, far more money than they have cost to be implemented. Since the Clean Air Act was passed, the U.S. economy has grown by 200 percent, and we have fostered a vibrant new clean energy industry that creates jobs without creating diseases associated with fossil fuel production. The regulation this committee majority is attacking today is typical of the Clean Air Act regulations that will save lives and money. According to CRS, the Utility MAC rule would save 6,800 to 17,000 lives per year, with a net savings of at least $48 billion. The Republican claim to be concerned that this life-saving public health standard will threaten the reliability of electricity supply. Once again, we are presented with a false choice. In this case, a false choice between electricity and clean air. Those of us who have been outside today breathe cleaner air right here in the Nation's capital as a direct result of the Clean Air Act. And yes, there are far more cars on the road and kilowatts of electricity being produced than when Congress passed the Clean Air Act in 1970. The primary Republican witness today, Virginia Attorney General Ken Cuccinelli, he has used his office to focus on narrow ideological issues um, that, uh, in my view, squander taxpayer investment. He subpoenaed, for example, former UVA professor Michael Mann in 2010 because he believed that Mann's well-regarded climate research might qualify as fraud under Virginia law. Not surprisingly, a circuit court disagreed. Now Attorney General Cuccinelli is appealing to the Virginia Supreme Court. The witch hunt has drawn condemnation from 800 Virginia scientists, the conservative Richmond Times-Dispatch, and almost every other major newspaper in the Commonwealth, the American Association of the Advancement of Science, and so many others. It is appalling the taxpayer money would be squandered in a vain attempt to discredit a single climate scientist. In addition to litigating against his own state's premier university, founded by Thomas Jefferson, he filed a lawsuit against the Federal Government for the EPA's finding that greenhouse gas pollution poses a danger to human health and welfare. Unfortunately, as a caricature for the modern Republican Party, 
Attorney General Cuccinelli has fulfilled the predictions of the Washington Post editorial board, suggesting that, it, given his bizarre ideas, he would very likely become an embarrassment to the Commonwealth. Um, I regret that we are holding this hearing instead of dwelling in, uh, going into other topics that I think would be more productive and would, in fact, create jobs. With that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Members will have seven uh, days to submit opening statements and extraneous material for the record. We will now recognize our first witness, uh, the distinguished Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Virginia, the Honorable Ken Cuccinelli. Pursuant to the committee uh, rules, all witnesses here will be sworn. Would you please rise to take the uh, oath? Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record indicate the witness answered in the affirmative. I am going to take a, a point of privilege very briefly. I appreciate your being here today. Uh, I am going to regret that there were some levels of the previous opening statement that may have seemed personal, and I apologize to the extent that you were offended. Uh, we appreciate your being here. We recognize you are one of many Attorney Generals that is involved in this. And uh, I think on an overall committee basis, I would say that we are very pleased to have you here as a representative and, and hope that you will take the spirit of the full committee without any questions that you may have from other opening statements. And with that, you are recognized. Yeah, you have to push the little green button first, and then you may have to get a little closer. Thank you. <clears throat> Chairman ISO Ranking Member Cummings, members of the committee, I am Ken Cuccinelli, Attorney General for the Commonwealth of Virginia, and I want to thank you for the invitation to speak about the MAC rule today. Uh, one of my duties as Attorney General, as is common among Attorneys General, is to serve as the attorney for utility customers uh, in my State, advocating for fair rates for customers when electric utilities seek rate increases from the Commission that approves them. Uh, as you know, public utilities that have their rates set by State commissions are entitled under the U.S. Constitution to recover from customers the necessary expenses they incur to provide utilities. Uh, that includes the expenses to comply with Federal laws and regulations. Uh, that means every time new environmental regulations are placed on electric utilities, it is actually the customers that I represent who pay the cost. Uh, this isn't to say that environmental regulations should automatically be rejected because they impose some costs, but it does mean the EPA should follow the proper procedures to ensure the alleged benefits of the regulation outweigh the real-world costs. And unfortunately, the EPA hasn't been following normal procedures. In its regulatory impact analysis for the MACT rule, the EPA conceded that the rule would increase electricity prices and would cost jobs in certain sectors. Yet the EPA admitted that it did not have sufficient information to quantify those losses. In fact, the rule will have a huge economic impact on this nation. First, it will increase electricity prices over the course of the next 5 to 10 years of between 10 and 35 percent. That will vary depending on where you are and what the conditions particularly of your generation and transmission are in your region. And that can be a financial death blow for businesses struggling to meet payroll and families on fixed incomes. Second, retrofitting power plants to meet the standards will, as you all know, be prohibitively expensive. So there is no question that certain plants will close and the Nation's electricity supply will decrease, leading to upward pressure on prices and likely brownouts and possibly blackouts in, um, in strained periods of use. The EPA even concedes that at least 10 gigawatts of electricity will be lost from the Nation's power grid. Of course, FERC's initial analysis says over 80. Um, that is a pretty dramatic difference between the EPA and the people who you would expect to know better. Uh, third, while the EPA says it can't quantify the number, it acknowledges that jobs will be lost. There are estimates of 180,000 jobs per year between 2013 and 2020. For Virginia, the situation is even bleaker than for the rest of the nation, though not Mr. Connolly's part of Virginia, which is where I live. A majority of the electricity for Southside and Southwest Virginia is generated from coal. 
Since the MAC rule will significantly increase prices for electricity pr produced from coal, the poorest part of my State will face the largest price increases, including part of Appalachia, one of the poorest parts of America. But it gets even worse. The most important industry in southwest Virginia is coal mining. These regulations make coal more expensive and less desirable to use, which means the economy of southwest Virginia, again, including Appalachia, will be devastated by the destruction of the coal industry and the jobs lost along with it. Now, whatever you think of the benefits of the MACT rule, a decision about whether it is prudent policy simply can't be made without considering these other impacts and not just for Virginia, but for the entire country. What is even worse is that for regulation this important, the EPA set just 140 day, 104 days, recently extended to 134, um, to review the more than 960,000 public comments on the impact of the rule. If you compare this to other significant rules where the EPA set review periods of more than a year with less comments. Uh, this abbreviated review period occurred because groups that support the EPA's position sued the EPA, and then, in a very friendly settlement, the EPA agreed to the short review period. This kind of gaming of the system is an affront to proper procedure and the rule of law, and it really should concern people across the spectrum. Uh, this obvious attempt to rush the rule through was so outrageous that, as you noted, Mr. Chairman, I, along with 23 other Republican and Democrat States Attorney General, the Governor of Iowa and the Territory of Guam filed an amicus brief asking the Court not to approve the consent decree's short time period. And given these major economic issues, it is not good enough for the EPA to say that it lacks sufficient information to quantify the negative effects of its regulations. It needs to collect that information before imposing the rule to make sure the benefits, in fact, outweigh the costs. If the EPA needs more time, then it should take it instead of gaming the system by entering into a consent decree that shortens the time for review. Thank you again for the opportunity to address these issues. Thank you. Uh, and even though I didn't limit you to five minutes, you were perfectly prepared to deliver for five minutes. I will now recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, the chart up there, I, I think uh, you are probably familiar with it, uh, General. Uh, it is a little deceiving, though, uh, for anyone watching it uh, here. That large blue line represents that nearly a million comments. The two others, I will read them because they look like they are not there, but there are actually lines there, <laughs> represent 214 comments in the case of the middle one, which, for which there was 344 days of, comment per, of, uh, of intervening period to evaluate. And then in the case of uh, Casper, 3,907, in which there were 278. Is there any logical reason, from your experience, both as an attorney and, and as a representative of your State, that you wouldn't have for nearly a million at least as much time as you had for 214 comments? No, not a logical reason, no. Well, then what do you think the reason is? Well, uh, it is hard to escape that this is being crammed forward, and I understand there are policy goals, but um, given the impact, and I would venture to guess, having not read all 960,000 comments, that I am sure no one has yet. I, well, I am sure they would even combine. No team has. Um, that they probably relate primarily not to mercury, even though that is where this all begins, um, because of the massive impacts across the economy and across the industries that are affected. Well, I am going to pull up, put up another uh, piece on this. Uh, can you? Get the, that diagram up. Yeah. This one baffled me a little bit. Perhaps you could help explain it. When we are looking at health related items in this new standard, if, if I read correctly, that little sliver of red there, that is the mercury that is going to be affected. Well, all of the blue area represents particulates. Is that your understanding of, of basically what we are dealing with here? My understanding is that nearly all, and that is consistent with this graph, of any alleged health benefits are going to come from the non-mercury elements of this rule. So most of the technology that has to be developed and implemented almost overnight, and most of the cost, is going to come from, if you will, the comparatively, not harmless, but 
particulate, not, in fact, mercury, as so many people are alleging. Uh, that is correct, and, and the technology necessary to achieve the mercury benefits, if left to stand alone, is a lot simpler and cheaper to utilize than what is necessary for the whole package. I am sure that is no surprise, but it, it also would cut dramatically, though it hasn't been quantified, into the shutdowns of plants. Well, let me ask one more question, because you have looked at the regulatory impact much more than anyone on the dais has. Uh, my understanding is that uh, when, you, when you, EPA's mandate to regulate particulates comes under NACs, a whole different discipline. Right. Doesn't it appear here as though they are combining 99 point some percent of this bill's effect under a section and a review process that isn't appropriate? Oh, absolutely. I mean, none of this is beyond EPA's reach through more explicit authority that they have elsewhere um, in the Act. And yet it has been put in, you know, uh, I know there is always in, or often in legislation there is sort of catch-all phrases and whatever else you think might be unhealthy kind of language. But when what gets crammed in there, along with the mercury, is explicitly addressed somewhere else, it seems highly inappropriate to address it this way. Well, a couple quick follow-ups. Uh, the uh, one of the ranking members from Virginia uh, mentioned uh, the 160,000 lives that the Clean Air Act saves each year by EPA figures. Many of the estimates appear that at least 280,000 jobs will be lost as a result of this legislation in its current form. How does that impact uh, your state of Virginia? Well, again, I'd point to. Uh, Virginia will be affected differently in different parts of the Commonwealth. And uh, if you go to Martinsville, where we have over 20 percent unemployment, there is a lot of lost manufacturing there from the NAFTA era that we are rather hopeful, if we can get an economic uptick and keep stable and relatively cost-effective energy prices, will become a manufacturing area again. This forecloses or makes it much more difficult for that to happen in that poor swath of Virginia where unemployment is particularly high. I already mentioned what happens in southwest Virginia, which is not a rich area either. There, and, and, then the and you are known for clean like, coal, but this would still be coal that would be offset. Yes. Uh, back to manufacturing, I mean, I wanted to focus on this because I am a former manufacturer myself. The nature of American manufacturing, as I understand it, is we take affordable energy and we leverage it to compete against less expensive labor in third world countries. And this essentially would take your maybe two cent a kilowatt hour power and increase it by maybe three or four times. It's, it's, a, it's a huge increase if your base fuel is, is coal and it becomes natural gas. Isn't that correct? Uh, it, it certainly is. I can't speak to the exact degrees of increase, but there is no question that, that um, the State we are in, um, it is much more marginal for us to become economically competitive, and anything close to the types of change that you have described um, takes us, makes us uncompetitive with large swaths of the world. Thank you. And my time has more than expired. I yield to the Ranking Member. Thank you very much, Mr. Attorney General. It is good for you to be here. Um, I would um, like to put into the record, I would like to have entered into the record a joint statement from the Attorney General of the State of Maryland, my State, uh, Doug Gansler and Robert M. Summers, the Secretary of the Maryland Department of the Environment. The statement asserts that Maryland has successfully implemented a law that required major reduction in mercury emissions from coal burning power plants. Maryland power plants have already reduced mercury emissions by 88 percent without affecting reliability, and in doing so has created jobs in Maryland. I ask that that be a part of the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, it has been documented that exposure to toxic pollution from power plants such as hydraulic um, acid, mercury, arsenic, and uh, other metals causes a wide variety of health conditions. Now, these include asthma, which I suffer from, and other respiratory ailments, developmental disorders, neurological damage, birth uh, defects, cancer, and death. Do you uh, disagree with any of those findings? Oh, I am really not in a position to give you medical assessment. I am just here to talk about the legal side. And the, I understand and the that, but you are sworn to protect the people of your great state, are you not? Sure am. And I would think that you would be taking consideration 
uh, anything that might cause the deaths, particularly from all of these different things. Certainly, that's, that's why I asked certainly, you. I'm not trying to take you out of your, yeah, your certainly purview. We take those things into consideration, always looking for a balance. Sure. Now, it has also been reported that among industrial sources in the United States, coal and oil-fired uh, power plants emit the most toxic air pollution, accounting for nearly 50 percent of all pollutants in 2009. Uh, do you disagree with that? I am not in a position to disagree. I would note that we have some co-located uh, among our utilities, oil and coal. And one thing we would love to have seen, because we use the oil very infrequently, only when we have peak demand, um, if those had been excluded from this rule, that is one way they might have provided more flexibility for peak demand while still achieving many of the pollution reduction goals that they have set here, but there was no exception made for that. Now, it, it has been estimated that the proposed air toxic rule would save up to 53,000 lives by 2016. Have you heard that? Are you familiar with that? I have heard that, yes. And um, do you have any reason to disagree with that estimate? Um, I, it st strikes me as um, quite optimistic, yes, but I don't, I don't it is such a large number, but I don't have a, I haven't done any independent research on that, no. Now, Mr. Attorney General, um, I understand that you asked a Federal judge, I think you testified to this, to delay the final air toxins rule for uh, one year making many of the same arguments you have made here today. Uh, is that, was, that a, was that in the form of a brief? or It was, yes. Um, and are you aware that the air toxic rules have been legally required by the Clean Air Act since uh, 1990, 21 years ago? Uh, I am aware of that, yes. And I would like to enter into the record the order of the judge denying uh, this request and the arguments, the same arguments we are hearing here today have failed legal scrutiny, and Congress should not be uh, giving them but so much weight. And I would ask that that be admitted in the room. Uh, without objection, although I would note that it went hand in hand with the 30-day ex uh, extension and, and may not be germane 30 days from now. I understand. But is that these are basically the same arguments? Is that right? I, that same judge said that, told the EPA that if they need more time, they could come back and she would grant it. So mm -hmm. it is not, from our perspective, a closed question yet. I understand. With that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. And we, we now go to the gentleman from the coal producing alternate capital, Cleveland, Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Happy birthday, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thanks, Dennis. Um, Mr. Uh, Attorney General, welcome to this committee. Uh, as Attorney General, isn't part of your responsibility to protect the residents of Virginia and not put them at greater risk for illness or even premature death due to air pollution? Uh, certainly, protecting the people of Virginia is an important part of my job, yes. Uh, is it your responsibility to protect the people of Virginia uh, from air pollution-related illnesses that could cause premature death? Part of what we do in my office is enforce environmental laws, and we are aggressive about doing that, so yes. How many, how many prosecutions have you had of environmental polluters in, uh, since you have been in office? Ordinarily, the way those are resolved is with uh, joint decrees that involve the EPA. Um, I don't know how many. I know that we have had a regular flow of them since I have. Have you recommended prosecution for polluters? And how many have you recommended? Could you be quite specific? Yeah, we have resolved all of them with consent decrees, meaning those who are defendants essentially admitted liability. We, we meaning who, Mr. Attorney uh, General? Inevitably, it is our Department of Environmental Quality, which we typically are negotiating on behalf of, and the EPA. Have, with have, you, ever, have you ever been involved personally in any negotiations related to uh, resolving uh, pollution complaints over uh, air pollution? Uh, my personal involvement has related to approving those uh, resolutions negotiated by the attorneys in my office and with the EPA and with the defendants in question. And do you know uh, what the outcome of those have been? Have they been uh, consent uh, agreements that have, we have uh, on behalf of communities that have, that have had complaints about pollution? Uh, yes. 
That is exactly how they have been resolved with typically uh, fines and requirements going forward enforced by court order uh, for uh, additional care to be taken, specific steps. So, so your office has been instrumental, uh, you are saying, in causing polluters to be fined. Do, yes. do, could, do you have any information you could present to this committee right now about specific cases? Uh, I do not, do not bring specific cases. But, but you, could pre, you could produce, will you produce for this committee a, a list of, uh, of such cases? I would be glad to. Uh, could, you, could you tell uh, members of this committee, and I, I was particularly interested in your, uh, some of the equations you were, you were talking about. Uh, you said that clean air standards, uh, I will paraphrase it, that they, they, can, they can cost jobs. Is that sure. your position? Uh, what kind of jobs do, do they cost? Could um, you be specific as to the types of occupations? Sure. Well, for starters, the, the most obvious is since we are a coal state, uh, Southwest Virginia and the coal industry is affected. And unlike, say, the part of Virginia where I am from, Northern Virginia, which has a fairly diverse economy, there is not a, an economic alternative in Southwest Virginia. So there is that challenge, which is the most overt. The, then comes uh, the industries and businesses reliant on energy as a major component of their costs. And uh, certainly any manufacturing that would take place, which we have in Virginia, primarily, though not at all exclusively, in the southern part of Virginia and up the western part of the State, um, though, again, it is scattered. Isn't it? Those oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I just, just wanted to, you are saying that they cost jobs by definition in the coal industry. Is that your position? Oh, well, sure. I assume that is well, well, here, cool. you know, but is it possible that uh, if, you, if you don't have clean air standards that it could also uh, create health problems for people? Uh, sure. That is the tradeoff here. That is the tradeoff. Now, is, is, is dirty air good for poor people because, uh, because there will be less poor people if the air is dirty, or is it, is it good for poor people because there will be less poor people if there is dirty air? Uh, dirty air isn't good for anybody. Jobs are good for everybody. Uh -huh. And can you, can you tell me, uh, if you are looking at job calculations about the jobs that are created by poor air standards. Can you think of jobs that are created by poor air standards? So the comparison that we are looking at, and it isn't our own, it is we are sort of swallowing all the studies, or as many of them being done, is compared to where we are now versus what is proposed. We are not suggesting anything ought to be undone, um, though I do think it would be far more appropriate for EPA to decouple some of the elements of the rule they are now proceeding on. Th thank they you, Mr. Chairman. I just wondered if the gentleman was including in in, in his advocacy, the jobs that are created for undertakers when people don't uh, survive as a result of poor air standards? <laughs> no. Uh, the gentleman may respond, if, if you would like. Sarcastically or in general? Um, you are the witness. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, um, uh, we are trying to look at this in the aggregate. And, uh, you, you know, as I said, the one overt industry that can really be addressed from a Virginia standpoint is the coal industry and the spinoffs there. And after that, it becomes the energy costs associated with the gradual rise in costs as those are incorporated through the utilities, because the utilities pay none of this, none of this. It is the rate payers who pay for all of this. And Mr. Chairman, I appreciate our, you giving the uh, yeah, gentleman a chance to respond, our, because he talked about the aggregate, which is what we have been talking about, because we are saying that 17,000 lives a year are on the line with respect to these uh, regulations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. I thank you both. Yeah. Uh, we now recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome again, Mr. Attorney General. Um, do you know what, you know, the National Capital Region, including Northern Virginia, um, is classified as a non-attainment region in terms of air pollution? Do you know what percentage of that air pollution is migrating pollution from coal-fired power plants? I do not. Would it surprise you to learn that about a third of the air pollution in this region is attributed to those? migrating pollution sources from coal-fired power plants not in this region? Well, I certainly wouldn't expect everything we deal with in this region to have started here. So 
I, I grant you that. But uh, the specific numbers I uh, can't really suggest. But, but certainly, as the Attorney General of Virginia, representing, as you point out, all of Virginia, you could understand some of the anxiety and concern in the northern part of the state with respect to pollution caused by coal-fired power plants. I, I don't think that uh, concern is quarantined to northern Virginia. I think it is uh, shared across Virginia. Point but well what taken. What is additionally shared is just a desire for balance to be achieved as, as we gradually try to keep our air cleaner and, uh, and uh, improve the standard of living in this country. Mr. Attorney General, um, the proposition here is that should this regulation go into effect, it would have devastating effect both on sources of electricity and on jobs. Um, in 1990, with the Clean Air Act amendments, similar arguments were made. Do you know what happened to the price of electricity in the Commonwealth of Virginia in the intervening? Back in 1990? No. No, in the intervening you, 21 years. Did it go up or down? I can speak to you back through the last decade or so, but I can't go back to 1990. Would it surprise you to learn that actually electricity rates in the Commonwealth of Virginia in that time period have actually fallen by 35.6 percent? It wouldn't, uh, would not entirely surprise me. Well, does that not call into question perhaps then? the claims that in this particular case that won't, that won't work and, in fact, electricity rates are going to go up. Well, Given the experience we have had in the last be, 21 years, why should we put credence in such an argument? Certainly it would be a lot easier to analyze that argument if there were more than 134 days to look at 960,000 comments, presumably uh, not all of which are substantive, but if you just compare them to, uh, to other rules, I mean, you all had your own here. From this committee, I would look at some others, like the chemical recovery combustion was two and a half years, reciprocating internal combustion engine a year and a half um, for cement, the Portland cement manufacturing. Mr. Cuccinelli, we're looking at four and a half months to consider the very questions you all are lobbying oh, this way with assumed answers. Mr. Mr. Cuccinelli, unfortunately, my time is limited, um, but certainly the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990 were far more sweeping than what's in front of us now. Um, what happened to electricity rates, for example, in other coal-fired power plant, uh, uh, states with coal-fired power plants? And I will list them, West Virginia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Kentucky, and Alabama. Are their electricity rates in the intervening 21 years since that sweeping set of amendments, are they higher or lower relative to 1990? Uh, I don't study other states' electricity specifically. I study the national and compare it to Virginia, unless mm. something borders Virginia and we have a rate case where that is relevant. Would it surprise you to learn they are also cheaper? Uh, no, I wouldn't be surprised either way, not knowing it. So. Mr. Cuccinelli, correct me if I am wrong, I was under the impression that, for example, on the Health Care Reform Act, the Affordable uh, Health Care Act, you were an advocate for nullification. You supported legislation. Uh -huh. You supported legislation in the General Assembly of Virginia that made universal mandates illegal in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Is that not correct? Nullification is an incorrect term, and it suggests you don't know history. Nullification is when a State says, we are not going to obey your Federal law. That isn't what happened in Virginia. The General Assembly, on a bipartisan basis, passed a law. Two weeks later, the President signed uh, PPACA, and those two were at con in conflict. And as our constitutional structure provides, we went to court to resolve the disputes of authority related to those two laws. That is not nullification, Congress. Would you stop the clock? Uh, if the gentleman would suspend. Yes. General Cuccinelli, you can answer any question you choose to answer. However, you are only bound to answer questions that are within the germaneness of the subject for which you were brought here. You may continue. Mr. Chairman, if, if I may. Um, of course. The purpose of my question was not to focus on health care. I wanted to give the opportunity to the uh, Attorney General to explain his position, because my question has to do with whether he, if you don't like nullification, then I will call it preemption. Um, does the Commonwealth of Virginia have a similar preemption right, if you don't want to use the word nullification, with respect to this regulation in your view as the Attorney General of Virginia? I think the Commerce Clause very clearly gives the Congress and therefore the Federal Government uh, the broad power to address something like pollution across State lines, whereas uh, if you compare that to the health care example, ordering a particular individual to go buy a product, not regulating them once they are in commerce, but ordering them into commerce is a completely different comparison. So my, I have no constitutional complaints 
with what is going on in terms of the exercise of Federal authority here. My concerns are policy concerns and legal process concerns. Yeah. And so, the, so you see the two as different. Processes, oh, absolutely. We put those processes in place to protect not only the rights, but to achieve the best policy outcomes. And I know, regardless of the opinions here, everyone here would like to achieve the best possible outcomes for this country. Um, I, I think that uh, we are more likely to do that if we actually take a legitimate amount of time to consider the material that is now before us that is simply, it is not humanly possible to consider all the comments that are now before us on this rule in the incredibly short time frame. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you. I now ask unanimous consent that we be able to place into the record the details of the 1990 Clean Air Act showing a five-year period for a rulemaking exception. Additionally, I ask unanimous consent that the statement by the Union for, uh, for Jobs and the Environment, these public comment utility, these are all union organizations combining, that, that says EPA data implied that no coal unit in the United States meets all the proposed new sources, HA, HAPS standards, regardless of the type of coal consumed or the effectiveness of its pollution control devices. And again, that is unions for a job, for jobs and environmental public comments. And with that, I would now recognize the former chairman of the committee, Mr. Towns. Wait a second. Did I get it wrong? I apologize. I now recognize the distinguished Norton. lady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton. I am sorry, I didn't see which one came first. I apologize. That is all right, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you. Um, uh, welcome, Mr. Attorney General. Uh, I, uh, there are, it appear to be two separate uh, forks to your complaint. One is the process, the time for the process. I would like to get to the substance, because it would appear that some states already implement stringent uh, mercury emission limits uh, that are even uh, more stringent mercury, mercury, mercury uh, emission li uh, limits than EPA is now proposing. So I, look, I went to a set of um, states close by, by the way, uh, Connecticut, um, New Jersey, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and um, New York. Now, here is what the Massachusetts uh, Department of Environmental Protection said. Experience in Massachusetts in imposing stringent emission limits for mercury and other pollutants clearly shows that EPA's proposed limits are achievable and effective. For example, although Massachusetts mercury emission limits for existing coal-fired power plants are considerably more stringent than those proposed by EPA, Massachusetts facilities have been able to install uh, control equipment with no impact on reliability of electric power uh, and have uh, demonstrated consistent compliance with the limits. Uh, now, Mr. Attorney General, aren't those same technologies available to the State of Virginia, for example? Well, presumably they are available everywhere, Congressman. Well, have you considered the, the possibility of, of using those, uh, those very uh, same technologies uh, to achieve the results in Virginia that have been achieved uh, even beyond those uh, that the EPA is proposing by nearby states? Uh, Congresswoman, I think you are focusing on what amounts to less than 1 percent uh, of what the EPA is doing, and that is the mercury piece of this. Mm -hmm. The mercury piece is a lot more achievable um, with a lot less damage than if you pile everything else on top of it. And all, all your statements with respect to mercury, I just accept them uh, as stated and would suggest that it wouldn't cause nearly, not, not on an order of magnitude, the kind of challenge that the whole rule that EPA is advancing. Well, but, but, Mr. Oh. Attorney General, the uh, Northeast States uh, for Coordinated Air Use says of EPA's proposed rule, and here is what they say of the rule itself, the successful track record demonstrates that there are no insurmountable technology costs, emphasis on costs, or at least I put the emphasis there, as you appear to, or timing barriers to achieving EPA's 
uh, proposed mercury and air toxics standards. Now, they're, they're speaking beyond the mercury standards. Uh, do you disagree with that statement? Um, I'm not quite sure what they mean by the air toxics. I assume they mean the acid gases, um, which is, you've got the mercury acid gases, you've got the particulate uh, matter. Um, uh, so if you, if you take the, the, the PM. Well, they say air toxics, so I assume they're talking about all the air toxics. Well, if they're talking about all of them, then no, I would not agree with that statement. If they were strictly speaking of the mercury piece. Well, they're not strictly uh, speak, speaking of that. that I do think the mercury piece uh, is probably within, within reach. Within and you think that Virginia could, in fact, then move forward on the mercury piece? If you strip the other stuff out and just Well, but these the people went, on, went ahead on their own, Mr. Attorney General, because right, they care about the health and welfare of their people, and they are beyond what EPA is now proposing. So you are going to wait for EPA? No, ma'am, they are not. They are beyond what EPA is proposing in the area of mercury and mercury alone. If, and what so they are beyond what they are proposing in mercury alone. Yes. They went ahead before EPA proposed them. I am asking you, don't you think Virginia might go ahead before on mercury alone since you think that is achievable? Uh, Virginia could do that, but it obviously has made the policy decision not to do that. Um, I would note that it, this all has, as I said before, the balancing consequences. We have a much lower unemployment rate than any state you just named. We have a higher economic growth rate than any state you just named, despite the economic challenges. Well, Mr. Attorney General, I don't know if that is the case, and I will not accept that until I look at those figures. But let's look at the, your, your, your concern with the process. I ask the gentlelady have an additional 30 seconds. I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, um, uh, are you aware that uh, the rule uh, finalized, uh, apparently in, to be finalized in December, would not, would not you would not have to comply with until 2015, and then e extensions uh, could be gotten after that uh, if you demonstrated that an extension was necessary. I am aware that if the rule goes into effect in mid or, or is approved in mid-December, it would go into effect in January and have a three-year implementation timeline. I also know what it takes to replace, to permit, do all the, all the steps necessary for the utilities in my state to replace certain uh, power generation that will have to be withdrawn in that time period. And we can't match the two up. We can get kind of close, but not match them in up. In which case, an extension, it seems to me, would be justified. Well, Thank you, Mr. The Ch Mr. Chairman. The extensions would undoubtedly be helpful. That is always true. Um, however, there is a limit on the EPA's authority to just extend, and relying on that from a business planning standpoint is not something that I can argue before my State Corporation Commission when the utilities come in and say, we have to meet this. They, they don't have to rely on the extension, and the law of Virginia, as dictated by the U.S. Constitution, because they are granted a right of return, is that those rates will pass through to all of our citizens, poorest, richest, and everyone in between. Thank you, Mr. I thank Chairman. the gentlelady and I thank the Attorney General. With that, I recognize the former Chairman of the full committee. Oh, I am sorry. We have the Chairman, you are just going to have to wait one more minute, five more. With that, I recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma for five minutes, Mr. Lankford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I do apologize for taking a little bit of the former Chairman's time, I guess, there and, and jumping in, in between. We will make it up to him. That would be great. Thank you for being here, uh, Attorney General. I am glad for you to be able to be here. My concern is, is that if I went back 35 years ago, in Cong Congress was conducting hearings and conversations about pushing power generation out of natural gas into coal and into nuclear, because we were, quote, unquote, running out of natural gas. And so no more natural gas power plants out there. Folks that were using that need to go into coal. Now, plus 35 years, now the Federal Government is saying, no, coal might not be a good idea. Let us try natural gas and see how that works and see if that is better, or see if there we can use wind. Or, and as we continue to adjust and, and at the preferences of the Federal Government, and now to use a series of studies to be able to justify how we want companies to be able to move, that is very difficult on power generation, who can't just plan for next year. They have to plan for next decade on what they are going to construct. My concern is the cumulative effect of all of these regulations, and if that has been evaluated, is it your opinion? of all the things that are coming down, and I have got three pages worth of um, different 
uh, regs that are coming down right now out of EPA uh, on power generation, whether that be 316B, whether that be the cross-state rules, whether that be uh, whatever it may be for coal, and there is a whole litany of different issues from coal from the time it comes out of the ground all the way until it is uh, fly ash at that point at the end. Do you feel like that has been adequately studied in this hurry to be able to get through this almost a million different uh, comments that have been made in it? Was the cumulative effects also evaluated in this? Uh, if you are asking me, do I think it was done adequately? Absolutely not. I mean, and this hasn't even gone to OMB yet, and they are still setting a, a finalization date in the middle of December. That is normally itself a 90-day process. And uh, of course, it is November now. So that isn't going to happen if they are going to keep to the schedule they have laid out. And, and uh, that has absolutely not been looked at. And you, you mentioned uh, something that triggered a thought, and, and my Go congressman ahead. had mentioned it earlier with respect to greenhouse gases, uh, and I think of the switching of, of, of fuels. You know, the, the fact that we had sued EPA over their improper process or in the greenhouse gas endangerment finding was raised by uh, earlier. And, what is interesting about this is if that is so important, this makes it worse. And, uh, and that hasn't been looked at either in any serious way. Or maybe it is buried in those 960,000 comments, but it seems the timeline has been set up so that they won't be reviewed, not that, so that they will. Right. And that, that is my concern, is that there has not been enough time to be able to go through this. The President has been very urgent to say we need to look at cumulative effects of regulations. If that has not occurred, to be able to gather cumulative effects of all these different regs that are coming down and the speed that they are coming down and the size of them. Uh, one of the statements that was made by EPA uh, was that this may have a potential of, what is it, $10.9 billion in annual cost on the economy. Well, just that one regulation alone, $10.9 billion. Uh, then you start adding to it all the different areas of 316B and everything else that is coming down on it. Uh, it's, it's fairly significant what is happening. And I, and I understand previous comments that have been made to say uh, we continue to add regulations to the power industry, but the power continues to go down. I would, I would presuppose at some point that doesn't work anymore. You can't just throw in 1,000 regulations and say we are going to continue to drive the cost down by adding more regulations. It doesn't work that way. At some point, you have got to have some common sense. Agree or disagree with that? I, I would certainly agree with that. And I would also note that um, Executive Order 13563 requires EPA and other regulators, and I will quote, that is why I am going to read my notes, to tailor its regulations to impose the least burden on society consistent with attaining regulatory objectives, taking into account the costs of cumulative regulations. And EPA has not performed a re cumulative regulation cost analysis for the utility MAC. Okay. What about the effect, uh, the effect on reliability of power in the days to come? I, I understand that is uh, widely debated here. It is not much debated in Virginia. We are looking at, um, just for one of our utilities, probably $250 million of transmission um, infrastructure costs. And again, those by law pass right through right. to the rate payers. But on top of that, from a, um, from a public policy standpoint, from you know, I was in the State Senate. These are the ones people scream about. This is where power lines are going to be built across 50, 60 miles of people's backyards right. um, that do not now exist and are going to be necessary to provide the flexibility in the grid to meet the uh, reliability requirements that you would expect of a modern uh, electrical grid. Right. So we are also looking at that challenge. We haven't talked about that at all. Right. Well, I would say, again, if, if we are going to make a major decision that is going to affect billions of dollars and it is going to affect future planning, we better make it right. Uh, you go back 35 years ago when we said, let's go to coal, because that is more abundant than it is for natural gas. Uh, now we are trying to reverse that. Obviously, we should have done more studies 35 years ago instead of doing a knee-jerk reaction. If we do the same knee-jerk reaction again, we are going to have the same kind of consequence if we don't do this right. So with that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman from a major natural gas producing state. And with that, we recognize the chairman, former chairman of the full committee, whose picture adorns the area just behind us, <laughs> Mr. Towns, for five minutes. That only means I've been here a long time. <laughs> okay, we'll make it six minutes. <laughs> Mr. Attorney General, you testified today that one of the impacts of the air toxic rule would be closure of coal fire power plants, which will in turn cause job loss. Is that correct? Well, and with the increased electricity cost that comes with it, yes. But evidence from our previous hearings on this subject before the Subcommittee on Regulatory Affairs 
suggests that many of these coal firepower plants are older and would have gone out of business anyway. What is your answer to that? I think that um, you are certainly accelerating the retirement of part of the coal fleet. Um, I don't think in a way that the utilities en envisioned necessarily, but uh, certainly that will be where they try to sacrifice some of their generation. That is just logic. Let me ask you this. Uh, uh, in a meeting on June the 1st with investors, the chairman of American Electric Power, a gentleman by the name of Michael Morris, told investors the, f the following, and I quote, As you know, those are high-cost plants. Throughout almost all of 2009, those plants probably didn't run 5 percent of the time because of natural gas prices. When we shut those down, there will be some cost saving as well. And on balance, we think that that is the appropriate way to go. What is your response to that? Well, for starters, I will certainly agree. You agree or disagree? Something I, and we have, you know, our second biggest utility is one of their subsidiaries. APCO is an AEP subsidiary. Um, the, uh, uh, the 5 percent comment, uh, we have some plants that fit in the category he described. Uh, I used the oil fired as an example. And, and mind you, there is some value to keeping fuel flexibility. Um, and just even if they are dirtier plants, even if they aren't what you would want run all the time, to have them available for peak time in the winter and the summer. Um, is, I would suggest, of great value to b on both a cost basis and a reliability basis uh, that far outweighs the uh, benefits you might get by shutting them down permanently, which is, as his comments suggest, what is going to happen. And um, I, I think um, when you moving them perhaps from a run 24-7, 365 position to using them as peak power would be a great alternative for America. It would achieve, even if you just accept all the health claims, everything, I don't, without disputing any of that, just moving them from one position to the other would be a huge boon and with tremendous cost savings from an opportunity cost perspective that aren't dropped on ratepayers because you move them over um, instead of shutting them down. But that is not an option under this rule. It is not an option under this rule. It is, in fact, the opposite, where you would have to put in all the upgrades, whether you are going to use them 100 percent of the time or five, for a 5 percent plant. So of course you are going to shut it down. Let me ask, um, AEP plans to uh, close two plants in Virginia, I think Clinch River and, and Glen Lynn. Is that true? Well, I don't know. I can't speak for AEP, but I certainly would expect that they are on the blocks, yes, for this. And AEP agreed to retire those plants under a 2007 consent decree over violations of environmental laws. Isn't that right? Uh, I don't know that shutting them down was part of any consent decree. Let me, um, I know my time is about to expire. Uh, Mr. Attorney, Attorney General, it seems to me that your testimony before us today is a transparent attempt to blame the government for the fact that many high-cost, dirty coal plants could not compete in today's market even before the air toxics rule goes into effect. But then they would be shut down of their own course. I, you know, and, and I know when he, your answer has been that you only represent Virginia, but in, when you uh, actually, uh, in, a, in the position of Attorney General, you do have to look at what happens in other states as well, and then you make an opinion, actually evaluate as to whether it is good, bad, or indifferent. You have to compare it with something. So uh, I want you to know that you do have to look at other states. You just can't look at Virginia. Yeah, my comment to that effect was only with respect to the specific data from those particular states. I, I agree with you that you have got to draw from the experiences of other parts of the country and other states. And, and I do do that in trying to do what is best for Virginia. I yield back and thank you very much for coming to testify.
Thank you. Let me make just a quick comment as well. Then uh, I'm going to take just a quick moment and then uh, yield to Mr. Connolly a, a quick moment, and then we're going to conclude this panel so we can make a transition as well. And just a comment on this as well. There, there are 25 other states, obviously, that are represented in this brief. Uh, that it's not just Virginia we're talking about at this point. Uh, so this this is not just a, a single state issue. This is a national issue on it, and uh, and all that is happening. And that currently, what what is what is in place on this is not just dealing with a small group of, of plants that are very out of date, but there are no coal plants that can abide by this nationwide. Uh, no one is at that standard at this point. And so that that's the challenge, to try to figure out what, what do we do with this that no single utility uh, will not be affected by this process on it. Uh, a quick question for the Attorney General on it as well, and that is dealing with the combined regulations. As, as we talked a little bit before about the cumulative effects of this, the American Coalition for Clean Coal Electricity uh, estimated that the, some of the combinations here, we are talking about an increase of electricity somewhere between 12 and 23 percent on it. I know we were guessing earlier on some figures. 12 to 23 percent hits the poor pretty tough, uh, especially. Uh, it, what, what numbers have you seen? What estimates would you we, put up? Um, in, in our last round of utility rate cases, and I'm in, we're now awaiting orders in what is the second round since I've been Attorney General, but in the last round, um, we saw, we, we actually analyzed the rate increases um, as it related to Federal, not State, just the Federal environmental regulation, and about 35 to 40 percent of the base rate increases were passed through of these environmental costs. In Virginia, unlike, say, North Carolina, um, our utilities can absorb these costs as they incur them on a rolling basis. In North Carolina, uh, utilities can't incur them until they flip the switch and throw the new plant online, which, of course, builds up costs, and it keeps their rates a little lower for a while, and then they spike. Um, so it, it happens a variety of different ways, but it goes up. And I have only had to have a couple of town hall meetings as Attorney General, and they were both on utility rates in the poorer parts of our State, because it is hard to describe from people who are not from poorer parts of a State what utility rates mean to the people in these households. When you talk about 10 bucks a month uh, or 20 bucks a month more, it is real money. It is real money in a small house that is pulling maybe 1,250 kilowatts, which is an APCO average. Um, that is big dollars to them. It hurts when they are on fixed incomes as a large swath of that portion of Virginia is relative to the rest of Virginia. Um, we see that a lot, again, in the poorest parts of Virginia. And make no mistake about it, um, there are going to be economic consequences. There is always a tradeoff. You all make these decisions all the time about where these tradeoffs should land. But make no mistake about this. The people hurt first and the people hurt worst economically are the poor. They are the poor. That is who you are going to hurt first and that is who you are going to hurt the worst. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with that, I yield three minutes to uh, Mr. Connolly. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would note uh, that uh, the Attorney General's uh, view of history and mine might be slightly different with respect to uh, utility rates in even the poorer parts of Virginia. Many of the rate increases he is referring to occurred subsequent to the re-regulation legislation passed by the General Assembly of Virginia, highly favorable to industry not particularly favorable to consumers. Mr. Attorney General, let me ask you uh, just one question. Um, you talked about utilities. The largest utility in the Commonwealth of Virginia is Dominion Resources. Uh, has Dominion Resources requested that you challenge the air toxic rule legally or that legislation be introduced to try to prevent it from being implemented? Uh, no. Uh, the, as I mentioned earlier on your um, mischaracterization of nullification, Virginia isn't in a constitutional position to step in on Federal environmental regulation of this type with a constitutional um, objection, even if we had legislation. Um, the Supremacy Clause of the Constitution has Federal law trumping State law. The health care case you asked about earlier, the Supremacy Clause contains an exception when the Federal law is not constitutional. No one I am aware of is alleging that what EPA here is doing here is unconstitutional, inappropriate, um, incredibly unique in terms of the speed 
particularly in light of the volume of the comments and the potential impacts, which even if you accept the EPA's perspective are still wildly in dispute? So the answer is that so far that largest utility in the Commonwealth has not asked you to, over, to seek to overturn the rule. I, 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 I mean in the Federal level. I'm sorry, you mean in the what? At the Federal level. I'm not referring to nullification. Uh, Have you received, no, as the Attorney General of Virginia, any uh, communication or indication from the largest utility in the Commonwealth that it would like you or others to, in fact, try to seek to overturn this pending rule? Uh, no. My concern is more with rate payers than it is with the utilities. Thank you. And, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just end uh, my, my uh, colleague from Virginia and I uh, do disagree uh, in terms of interpretation of history. Uh, frankly, when a State seeks to preempt Federal law and to argue on its own that that law is in advance unconstitutional, is nullification by any other uh, sense of the word? Not if you know what and, you're talking about. I think I do know what I'm talking about, and I think you have an agenda, Mr. Attorney General. It's just one I happen to disagree with. With that, I yield back. With that, we'll Chairman? Take a, yes, sir. Uh, before you end the hearing or recess the hearing, I wanted to take just a moment, if I may. Certainly may. We had three minutes going all the way around. So, there you go. Mr. Attorney General, I want to thank you for your presence here. I want to thank you for working for the interests like nearly half of all uh, attorneys generals have uh, to try to make sure that we get this new regulation right. I appreciate your being calm and deliberative in explaining what your goal is, what Virginia could do more expeditiously, and quite frankly, uh, the need to have nearly a million public comments evaluated in, in the way that is appropriate before we set a regulation that people may ask for t as, uh, extensions on, but which may in fact be a different regulation than if all these uh, comments are properly uh, viewed in a public way. So, uh, your attention here, your willingness to uh, come on short notice, we very much appreciate. And uh, again, I, uh, I appreciate people willing to come before this committee. It is not always pleasant, but your testimony was essential. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And with that, we will take a short recess uh, so we can shift to the next panel. Thank you.
The hearing will reconvene. We now recognize the Honorable Robert Persichepi. Uh, he is the Deputy Administrator of the United States Environmental Protection Agency, and it is an honor and a pleasure to have you here today. Pursuant to the committee rules, all witnesses are to be sworn. Would you please rise to take the oath and raise your right hand? Thank you. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the rec record re uh, reflect the witness answered in the affirmative. Uh, pursuant to the normal routine, uh, I know you have five minutes or more to give. Uh, you, your entire statement will be placed in the record. Uh, you may read off of it or you may summarize it, and uh, uh, we would only ask that you try to remain fairly close to the five minutes to allow time for questions. And with that, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and Representative Conley uh, and members of the committee. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today on the mercury and air toxics standards. Is yeah. your microphone on? Can you, can you hear? I will move in. Oh, good. Okay. I will move in a little closer. EPA's clean air power plant rules are, are necessary to protect public health and the environment from pollution produced by these plants, especially the oldest and dirtiest and least efficient of them all. The EPA will issue a final mercury and air toxic standard, which is the topic of today's hearing, on December 16, 2011. We are not the first administration to recognize the need to clean up power plants and to issue rules to address that need. In fact, since 1989, when President George H. W. Bush proposed what became the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990, power plant cleanup has been the continuous policy of the United States government under two Democratic and two Republican Presidents. While past EPA rules have made progress in reducing the harmful effects of pollution, more remains to be done to ensure all Americans have the clean environment to which they are entitled. The two clean power to clean air power plant rules, the mercury and air toxic standard and the cross-state air pollution rule finalized earlier this summer, will achieve major public health benefits for Americans that are significantly greater than the costs. These pollution-reducing rules are affordable and they are technologically achievable. There is tremendous public support for moving forward with these rules. Since March, we have received hundreds of thousands, as has already been mentioned, of comments from the public urging us to reduce mercury emissions from power plants. The mercury and air toxics rule will have a significant public health benefit. For example, it will reduce mercury, which can cause neurological damage in children who are exposed before birth. The rule, as proposed, also is projected to avoid thousands of premature deaths, thousands of nonfatal heart attacks, and hundreds of thousands of asthma attacks. This rule would provide Americans with $5 to $13 in health benefits for each dollar it costs. Our analysis and past experience indicate that warnings from some, of the, from some of dire economic consequences of moving forward with these important rules are exaggerated. While not its focus, the, the mercury and air toxic standard rule has the potential to improve productivity and provide jobs. We estimate that the proposed rule would result in 850,000 fewer work days missed due to illness and could support 31,000 job years of short-term construction work, the net of $9,000 of long-term utility jobs. Money spent on pollution controls at power plants provides high-quality American jobs in manufacturing steel, cement, and other materials needed to build the pollution control equipment, in installing the equipment, and in operating and maintaining the equipment. And many of these jobs that are jobs that will not be and cannot be shipped overseas. In fact, the United States is a leading exporter of pollution control equipment. Our publicly available analysis shows that the EPA rules affecting power plants are affordable. This is corroborated by other outside groups and some in industry who recognize that issuing the rules in the same time frame helps provide power companies with the certainty they need to make smart and cost-effective decisions. As we did more than two decades ago, we are also hearing claims that our rules will lead to potential adverse impacts on electric reliability. EPA's analysis projects that the agency's rules result in only a modest level of retirements that are not expected to have an adverse impact on electric generation resource adequacy. Our rules will not cause the lights to go out. While there are some industry studies suggesting that these rules will result in substantial power plant 
retirements. In general, they share a number of serious flaws. Most notably, as the Congressional Research Service emphasized in August, these studies often make assumptions about requirements of the rule that are inconsistent with and dramatically more expensive than the EPA's actual proposals. In some cases, the analysis were performed before many of the regulations in question were even proposed. In closing, I would like to suggest that the Committee should be clear about what is at stake here, and those who have stalled in cleaning up their pollution call for, as those who have stalled their cleaning, uh, in cleaning up their pollution call for further delays. Delay encourages companies to avoid upgrading America's infrastructure and putting people to work modernizing their facilities, and most importantly, delay means the public health benefits reducing harmful pollution are not realized. Thank you, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Uh, and I will recognize myself for the first five minutes. Uh, and I will kind of take your, your opening statement in reverse order. If I understand the nature of every time there is one of these pollutant standards, I just want to understand, you really don't do, usually do much to the overall facility. It is normally a bolt-on of some additional cleaning equipment. Isn't that true in this case? Um, Yes, but it ha obviously from an engineering perspective, it has to be integrated into the operation of the facility. Right. So it requires... Well, and, and that begs the bigger question. Isn't it true that today there is no utility that you can show us that is able to implement this entire standard today? I know there are pieces of it in various places, but no utility is currently able to implement. Isn't that true? Uh, I, I don't believe that that is correct. I believe we look at the best performing uh, plants around the country. Well, and we looked at that, and, and you looked at each plant, and you put together various plants and said, if you do this and this and this, like Frankenstein, you can get one person. Uh, but you make the assumption that you can put together the best of all these plants. Uh, some of these plants have different non-combinable operations at the current time. Isn't that true? I, I believe that plants uh, can meet these standards, and, and some do, uh, but I would, uh, I would like to now, Is there any plant that meets the standard today? You said some do. I, I believe they do. Uh, but I would if you will answer for the record of a single plant that meets this standard today, we would be thrilled to hear that, because we I, just had a, an Attorney General, one of 25, 24, I'm sorry, who have asked for a delay, as you know, in order to get public comment, but most importantly, have asserted, uh, as does, and I will put it in for the record, the Unions for Jobs and the Environment Public Comments, uh, a union, uh, combined un uh, trade union organization, who believe that today there, are, there is no standard. Isn't it not uncommon that the EPA believes that a standard will be, a, the compliance with a standard can be achieved within the time parameter and that it might be? and I want to give the benefit of the doubt, it might be that you could, uh, they could achieve it by 2015. Isn't that part of the assumption, not that it exists today, but that if you take all of the analysis, that they could achieve it by 2015? The, um, the air toxic standards that we are proposing for, um, for power plants has to be based on available technology that is currently performing at the level that we are proposing. Okay. So if you will, for the record, have the EPA deliver us one power plant of, let's just say, megawatt or above, that uses coal that currently meets the standard. We would appreciate having that for the record, and we will hold the record over, open Thank you. Thank you. to receive that. Now, if we could put back up uh, the uh, pie chart. Earlier today, we had one of those 24 attorneys general who said, although he's not a not a scientist skilled in this area, but that he believed that when it came to the area that would be under this normal regulatory process, which is the mercury, that incredibly small sliver of pink, that if, if this standard were only affecting mercury, he believed that a shorter common period with a, uh, a great likelihood of, a, of achievement was possible. Do you agree with that, that mercury is not what is driving most of the objections from what you can tell? Um, that is be, that that chart is correct. Um, the um, the the best I can tell, uh, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Okay, I mean it's um, from your analysis, but we but couldn't resist I, using I, your I, own I, your I, own I, figures because they seem compelling. I, so, isn't it disingenuous 
the term we like to use here in Washington more often than maybe we should. But isn't it disingenuous to, for the EPA to talk endlessly about mercury and its effects, all of which we're, we're very concerned about, when in fact the vast majority of this regulation has to do with particulates and if not 920 out of 930,000 comments, the vast majority of those comments are about the mercury portion, a portion which is probably achievable uh, well within the time parameter. Um, the, the effects of mercury on children affects their neurological no, 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 systems. No, no, no. Me, my my, my question is very this. narrow. It is not about the effects of mercury. It is if, in fact, the technology exists today or can predictably exist in time to meet the 2015 as to mercury, isn't the combining of particulate, normally covered by another part of your uh, authority, a fairly disingenuous use right. of the benefits? Because the benefits of, of reducing the mercury and the technology to reduce the mercury appears not to be in widespread conflict. In fact, you, you, if this was a mercury-only standard, you might likely have uh, uh, much quicker, much greater support for a much quicker implementation. Right. You have to let me try a little bit here to answer but of course. that question. Um, first of all, we can't quantify all those benefits from the from those neurological impacts on children. Those are not quantifi completely quantifiable, as we are able to quantify some of the fine particle um, uh, co-benefits. And the reason we have co-benefits is because the pollution control equipment that you would use for mercury, for arsenic for nickel, chromium, and the acid gases, which are all regulated under the air toxics program, all of which have public health implications, uh, we think having co-benefits is a good thing and that those co-benefits also have substantial uh, public health benefits. So um, it is those same pollution control, uh, um, e that it is that same pollution control equipment that is uh, making those reductions in fine particles. It isn't like we have we've asked for a separate control for fine particles. These are the controls that will reduce those other emissions. And with that, I recognize the ranking member from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. If if you wanted to continue, I would certainly yield to the chairman. Okay, I, I, very quickly, I just want to run one follow-up. I thank the gentleman. Uh, as I understand it, roughly 90 percent of the benefits that you're claiming under this regulation would already occur under particulate reduction uh, that under, under max. Isn't that true? In other words, you are double counting. You, you have another regulation that would cover 90 percent of this. You are counting 100 percent of the reduction in particulate when, in fact, 90 percent of it is going to occur and most of the benefit. So I guess for the record, would you tell us what that last, the differential between the two standards, that last 10 percent on particulate, what portion of the co-benefit would actually occur? In other words, the numbers for what is a, the last little fraction of reduction. I, I, did you say NAX? By the NAX program, which, which is, a, in other words, the amount of reduction here for, and the cost, my understanding is that about 90 percent of the particular reduction under that part of the regulatory authority is already ordered, basically. Um, well, all I can say, what, what, I'm, what I have to answer here is this, this rule is aimed at reducing the toxic, air toxic emissions. Those air toxic emissions that I mentioned, those metals uh, and acid gases, are, are associated, the same control technologies are used. No, I, know, I understand that, but here, here's the point. Much of this standard for particulate is below what you say is safe by your own figures. So under NAX, when you, when you say you get down to this, air, air, this level, you now have clean air. You have defined clean and safe. And yet in this regulation, you are regulating a standard lower than what you say is necessary. In a nutshell, isn't it true that your regulatory authority ends at the point in which air is safe. We, we are now, wait a second. Your staff is shaking no behind you. So yeah. if, if you can answer that. that you think you have a regulatory authority beneath a threshold which is safe by your own standard, I would like to hear it. Two quick points. We are regulating air toxics here, and, and it is a technology standard that is looking at the, the best available 
technology, the maximum available control technology, that is what the MAC stands for, for those air toxics. It gets those benefits, it gets those co-benefits of reducing fine particle pollution, which we think is great, and there are health benefits even below the standard. Well, so then I will uh, and, and the ranking member has been very generous, but then why is it you have 15 milligrams per cubic meter per billion, et cetera, et cetera? You have this 15 milligram standard, and yet you have got your, your new standard. You are now setting, and that is what you have considered safe on one hand, and then you come in below 11.5 milligrams, M3. Uh, and it's, I mean, I can't think in terms of that small, but I agree that particulates, even in these small amounts, are important to look at. But why wouldn't you change your standard? Support it with science. Change your standard to an, an item uh, to an amount below 11.5 before regulating before 11.5 and claiming benefit below 11.5. Doesn't it seem like you've declared clean as 15, and you're regulating below that and taking credit for cleaner? If, and I'm not a scientist, and I will not claim to have any expertise in this. I can just look and say. There is an inconsistency, like a set of books that don't balance. You may not know where the missing money is, but if they don't balance, you go looking for it. Why not have a standard that is adjusted based on science to match this greater regulatory request you are making? We, we are regulating the air toxics here, the, the, the nickel, the arsenic, the mercury, the acid gases, the control technologies that we use. But you are claiming the benefits from the particulates. But those benefits are real. Those benefits will accrue to the American public. Then why not, lower the, sta why not lower the standard to 11.5 or below so that you are consistent in what you say you want to reduce the, the particulate level? The National Ambient Air Quality Standard is set under a science process uh, where we have science advisors that advise us on what level is adequate, adequate for the protection of public health. It doesn't mean that there aren't public health benefits below that level, and that's what we are, that's what we are um, looking at here. These are co-benefits from controlling uh, the air toxics that, that is the objective of this particular rulemaking. Well, it's clear as mud, but uh, I thank you for your efforts, and I recognize the ranking member. I thank the chair. Um, Mr. Precipice, I'm sorry. Purchasepi. Purchasep. Um, the chairman uh, said, asked you the question of, of whether any coal-fired power plants in the United States uh, could possibly be compliant with the proposed new rule. I have a list in front of me of existing coal-fired power plants, it is a partial list, that are already fully compliant with EPA's proposed rule, including four in my native state of Virginia despite the testimony of the previous witness that nobody in Virginia could be compliant, I have got four power plants, coal-fired power plants, that are fully compliant today. Uh, are you aware of that, that, this list? I, I know there are some that are in compliance with the rules. I just don't I would ask without there. objection that this I, list be entered. I do know there is a new one under construction in your state yes. at, uh, at Virginia City. Mr. Chairman, I would ask unanimous consent that this be entered. And we will be, providing, the, we will be providing information. Thank the Chair. Well. Is it not also true that nearly 60 percent of all coal-fired power plants who, uh, that report emissions to EPA are compliant currently with EPA's proposed limit for mercury? I don't know the exact number. Perhaps my uh, staff behind me have the exact number. Again, I would, we, 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 again we, I would ask that uh, this it, be entered I, into the record. To be clear, we can't base the standard on something that hasn't been met by, by an existing plant. Correct. My point in asking you this question is that this notion that uh, the hobnail boot of government is going to destroy industry and consumers and uh, cut off uh, the source of electricity in the United States is a false premise, given the fact that 60 percent are already compliant on the mercury standard. Is it not further true that 73 percent of all reporting units are already compliant with the proposed limit for HCI? It's, it's likely. And 70 percent, I would ask that be entered into the record, too, and that almost 70 percent of all units are compliant with the EPA's proposed limit for PM, a particular matter. Yep. So what we are trying to do is make at the margins an improvement for those not compliant, some of which, as we already heard in previous testimony, are older plants that are probably on the chopping block anyhow and would serve both consumers and the breathing public if they sort of use this occasion to perhaps uh, move on. Um, we also heard from the chairman 
concerns about, well, well, why didn't you just take a lower level? Um, didn't the previous administration try that tack? And wasn't there a, a court ruling that it was it required more rigorous enforcement? Um, I mean, on, on fine particles, I, I think it was on ozone that there might have been a, a, a court ruling or, or court activity, but I don't know about fine particles. Well, but the, 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 the bottom line is that, that there are health benefits. You are talking about this rule. Not yes, the this rule. Ambient. Yes, the, the previous administration, um, for, first of all, there is a 20-year history. Please finish your sentence, Mr. There is a 20-year history here. Yes, Mr. Well, you were just about to say the previous administration. The previous administration proposed uh, controls for mercury in, in 2004. Um, and, uh, and what did and, a court and, of and law? The court, the court uh, um, threw those out because they did not comply yes, with Yes, that the, is the answer to the Chairman's question. Yes. Why are you doing this? It is not unique to the Obama administration. The previous administration tried doing what the Chairman suggested. Why not just settle for a lower level? And a court of law said, not good enough. And it told EPA in a court suit, you have to come up with new regulations. There are tougher than that. Is that not correct? Well, it, the court said that the um, yes, that is correct. It Thank had you. to be regulated under a different part of the Clean Air Act. Thank you. So that is the answer to why you are doing what you are doing today. A court told you you had to, and threw out the Bush administration attempt to, look, to have a lower standard. Um, it isn't because you just, you know, in some lab somewhere decided to just be, you know, a pain in everyone's side by coming up with tough, hard-to-reach regulations, and as the data shows, they aren't, since the majority of the units reporting already meet one or more of the regulations. Was this standard on toxic pollutants uh, envisioned or incorporated in the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments? Yes. The, the Congress why, had, why did it take 21 years then to implement the law passed in 1990, un, uh, signed into law by a Republican president? Well, um, it's hard to, it's hard to uh, imagine that it has taken 21 years uh, to, to get to this particular point, which obviously uh, flies in the face that we are going too fast. Um, it, has been, it has been looked at numerous times by EPA. It had, there have been proposed regulations that were not uh, properly uh, completed. And we are in the situation now in this administration of having to be guided by the judicial branch uh, toward the end that, that we are now uh, aiming at. Thank you, Mr. Giuseppe, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Social studies was a long time ago for me, civics. I am familiar with the legislative branch. I am familiar with the executive branch and even occasional executive branch overreach. Sue and settle um, was new to me until I got here. Th does EPA ever encourage groups to sue them? No. In fact, the, um, uh, usually uh, we get sued when we are not doing what Congress asks us to do, and that usually is what results in us getting on a schedule that is different than the schedule so Congress you, set. So you never invite lawsuits? No. And there would never be anything to indicate that you had suggested that someone sue? A friendly lawsuit, shall we say? No. Never? Not that I know of. Um, what is so talismanic about December 2011? Um, 21 years. Uh, waiting, uh, health benefits denied. Um, uh, the, uh, the well, if we've waited 21 years and we have almost a million comments, um, wouldn't you think we ought to wait maybe 22 so we can fully digest all one million comments? Well, it might be good to say something about those million comments since they've come up. If you, if it's, if you would appreciate that, um, of those million comments, 900 and something thousand, the vast majority are in favor of the rule. And um, of those million comments, as you know, some people have systems that they can reply, only about 22,000 are uh, unique among, you know, as opposed to duplicates of, of comments. Well, 22,000 is still a lot. I mean, it is it's not is. a million. 22,000 seems like a lot to digest between now and Christmas. It, it, it is a lot, but it is not between now and Christmas. Uh, again, we have been, the, the, been working on this rule for a long time. The uh, comment period, we left the comment period open longer than we normally do uh, so that we, would, we expected to get a lot of comments. We Have you asked the court staff, for more time? 
Pardon? Have you asked the court for more time? This is a, this is a, a, a court decree, I, I assume. That this is, is a judgment? And we, we recently asked the court for another uh, 30 days to, to finish the work. We, we have read every one of those comments, and we will be replying to every one of those comments uh, in the response to comments document that we are currently working on. And we knew that we would get a lot of comments because we left the comment period over, lo, open longer than we normally do, and therefore we put the staff to, to task to, that we would need to be able to, to uh, review those comments. Did you have an opportunity to, uh, to listen or watch the President's uh, joint address to Congress uh, several weeks ago? I did. Um, he mentioned regulations and he mentioned some that are um, having a deleterious, pernicious effect on industry. Uh, then he said we should have no more regulation than is necessary for the health, safety, and security of the American people. And I think he's identified 500 that, um, at, at least 500 that can uh, be done away with. It, it strikes me as curious, or let me ask before I say it strikes me as curious, are you arguing that this, the imposition of this regulation is actually going to create jobs? Um, we, we believe that the construction jobs and then the operation and maintenance jobs will be a net positive in this sector. How many, how many coal jobs do you think will be lost? You know, we, we, we expect, uh, you know, one of the things you have to realize is we are investing in coal, the, 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 we, the country, not me, EPA, we are investing with this rule in coal fire power plants. We are going to make a major capital investment. I probably didn't ask my question the, artfully. How many coal jobs do you think we'll lose? I mean, I, I, you think we are going to add some constru construction jobs. How many jobs will be lost? Because neither one of us are naive enough to believe there are, aren't going to be jobs lost. I expect that the, the, the amount of coal that is used uh, will be roughly flat. Uh, the, the plants that we will invest in here, which will be many, what analysis? Um, will, will, um, will then lock in the fact that we are going to be using coal for many, many, many years. What analysis did EPA do with respect to job loss? We have a range that we have identified. 9,000 permanent job gains is in the middle of the range. There are some that go just slightly below zero. I am just asking about job loss. I, I hadn't gotten a jobs gain. What analysis did the EPA net, do net, about job loss? The best estimate of the net gain is 9,000. So EPA did factor in the losses to the coal industry and, and, and others? Yes. Okay. Um, My time's up. Sorry. I uh, want to thank you on behalf of Mr. Connolly and myself. Uh, give me one second. On behalf of Mr. Connolly, Chairman Issa, and myself, thank you. And uh, we will be briefly in recess as the third panel approaches. Okay. And uh, we will provide the information that I suggested to the Chairman uh, in, in follow up. And of course, every question that, that you all have will follow up with as quickly as possible. Thank you for your time and I appreciate the questions. Very well. Thank you. Uh, we, we will be in recess for five minutes.
hearing will now reconvene. We now welcome Mr. Josh Bivens. He is an economist at the Economic Policy Institute. Mr. Bivens, I noticed that you were here for the previous panel, so uh, you recognize that pursuant to our rules, all witnesses are sworn. Would you please rise to take the oath? Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Once again, let the record reflect the witness answered in the affirmative. And once again, the witness is recognized for five minutes for his opening statement. I thank the committee for the invitation to testify today. My name is Josh Bivens. I'm an economist at the Economic Policy Institute in Washington, D.C. Um, by professional peer-reviewed research standards, the ratio of benefits to cost of the EPA's air toxics rule are, are very large. But somewhere along the way, the debate moved onto the grounds of job creation, which is a little odd, because regulatory changes just aren't big drivers of job growth. But in my testimony, and especially in my written testimony, I sketch out how regulatory change in general and the air toxics rule specifically can affect job creation and unemployment. I conclude that the air toxics rule, like almost all related regulatory changes, will have trivial effects on job growth over the longer run, but that over the next couple of years, particularly if the unemployment rate remains high, the rule will actually on net create jobs and lower the unemployment rate. Further, it is precisely because the unemployment rate is high today that the rule, if implemented as planned, would have clearly positive impacts on job creation. So in short, calls to delay implementation of the rule based on vague appeals to, to wider economic weakness um, have the case entirely backward. There is no better time than now from a job creation perspective to move forward with these rules. My research, which I summarize in my written testimony, indicates that the toxics rule or adoption of the air toxics rule would lead to the net creation of about 28,000 to 158,000 jobs between now and 2015. The primary economic impact of these rules will be in significantly boosting health and quality of life, leading to benefits that are at least five to ten times larger than the cost. But since we are here to talk about jobs, or at least that is why I have been asked here today is to talk about jobs, let me just say a couple of words on it. The job impacts of regulatory changes depend on the wider macroeconomic context. When the economy is functioning well, job impacts from regulatory changes are going to be quite small for, for two main reasons. The most important reason is just that in a well-functioning economy, the Federal Reserve can neutralize any boost or drag on overall employment growth that may result from regulatory changes through their conventional monetary policy measures. They can raise or lower short-term interest rates. We may criticize the specific targets that the Fed adopts at given times, I know have, but in a well-functioning economy, they will be able to hit these targets. Moreover, the direct first-round impacts of regulatory change on employment growth are going to be modest anyway because they carry offsetting influences, so the Fed won't even have to do that much to, to counterbalance them. On the one hand, employment because of regulatory change is boosted because of the extra investments needed to bring producers into compliance, so power plants purchasing and installing scrubbers. On the other hand, a rise in the price level of energy because of the regulatory change may be transmitted to the overall economy by causing a slight rise in overall prices, and this may cause a reduction in spending. But it is clear that the first round impacts, before the Federal Reserve decides to neutralize them, of regulatory change are indeterminate. And it is important to note that even regulations that have large measured compliance costs are no more likely to lead to job losses than those with smaller compliance costs. Compliance costs go on both sides of the job creation ledger. They represent both the scale of investments needed to bring firms into compliance, and they represent sort of the potential increase in prices that may result from them. When the, unemployment, when, when the economy is not functioning well, specifically a time like today, when unemployment is high, even as the short-term policy interest rate controlled by the Fed sits at zero, um, this analysis changes. And the most important way it changes is that the Fed can no longer neutralize any effect of regulatory changes on employment growth. Um, so instead of the Fed counterbalancing any change, these changes are actually likely to have multiplier effects that, that will ripple through the economy. The briefing paper that my written testimony is based on assesses these positive and negative first-round effects as well as the effect of the likely multipliers through the economy, and it comes to the finding that positive effects dominate. And I just want to point out quickly that its estimates are, are awfully conservative. Basically, they are conservative because the only real adjustment to the results I make is the assumption that the Fed can't or won't lean against whatever happens to employment because of the regulatory changes. But actually, there is plenty of reason to think that there will be very little scope for the overall price level to actually rise, given how much slack demand is in the economy today. I mean, basically, the idea that when you know, the capacity utilization rate of utilities is at the lowest rate on record that regulatory changes will lead to large price spikes is a very hard thing to, to um, believe. And second, 
When you have economies with high rates of unemployment, chronic excess supply, um, they often see rapid disinflation, and that is what the U.S. economy has seen basically since what we now call the Great Recession started. And this disinflation actually leads to real interest rates rising, even while the Federal Reserve is trying to keep them down, and this provides a break on economic growth. So even if the price increase in the power generating sector, sector is passed on to the overall general price level, this will actually arrest the upward pressure on real interest rates, and this would be as likely as not to be positive for overall demand. Um, I don't include this latter consideration as an effect in my paper. So in short, I think my estimates of the likely job impacts of the air toxics rule by 2015 actually allow the widest scope possible for the negative impacts to, to run free, so I think they are very conservative. Um, to conclude, I want to be clear. This is not a major jobs program. It is something that should be done because it will uh, help Americans' health, but it will not reduce job growth. I thank the gentleman. I yield myself five minutes. Uh, first of all, I want to compliment you. I have never seen an economist with so many hands. Uh, I, uh, I tried to listen to your, your opening statement, and it was, it was pretty amazing because it did balance so many but, 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 but. Uh, so uh, I will look forward to going through your conclusions once again after the hearing and, and see if I can't reconcile them. Uh, but let me go through a few things that I think are appropriate to your presence here today. Uh, first of all, uh, you are here uh, funded by the, uh, the, the Blue-Green Alliance, is that right? No. No. Uh, I am okay. an employee of the Economic Policy Institute. Do you work with the Blue Green Alliance? Um, yes, I have. So, would you say it's fair to say that a, a coalition of, of unions and environmentalists are essentially the, the people that you work with closely? I have in, worked with closely, yes. Would it surprise you to know that the International Brotherhood of Electric Workers, the FL CIO, has opposed the, the implementation of this standard at this time? I did know that. Okay. Well, without objection, I'd like to enter that uh, letter into the record. Without objection, so ordered. The uh, I'm I'm not a uh, uh, I'm not an economist. I don't have a, a Ph.D. So I'm going to try and make everyone who looks at the record of this uh, hearing a little bit simpler. Uh, and I appreciate the, the, the breadth of your knowledge and capability to balance that. So I'm, I'm not taking away from it, but I just think that most of us have to understand this a little differently. This standard does not create new, less expensive energy. Is that correct? No, it does not do that. It does, however, when fully implemented in 2015, uh, reduce pollutants and thus has he positive health benefits. Is that right? That is my understanding. Okay. And although there are some jobs created as a result of implementing this standard, those jobs are by definition either temporary, the 37,000 or so, or permanent. But the permanent ones are by definition greater ongoing cost of producing the same amount of electricity. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that's correct. Okay. So to put it in terms that uh, my economist uh, or uh, economic professor at Kent State would have said, those are rocks in the knapsack. The benefit is you get cleaner air, and whatever you get from that is fine. But your ability to walk long distances are impeded by the rock in the knapsack. And this is an additional burden, additional ongoing cost of producing the same amount of electricity. Would you say that is correct? Uh, with one caveat. I mean, yes, I think it is we are using more labor to produce the same amount of energy, but we are producing cleaner energy than we would have without that labor. Right. And the benefit of cleaner energy would be the health care benefits, clearly, and we, we all agree to that. So on one hand, you have got a rock in the knapsack. You have got this cost, and the cost is at least 9,000 permanent greater jobs, uh, estimated to be about $11 billion by the what we might call the low side, the EPA's own estimate of best case. But we will forget about the dollars. We just understand that you will have 9,000 more jobs to produce the same amount of electricity, and those jobs will add forever to the cost of producing that energy. So with that assumption, as we look at the speed with which they want to implement this, three years after only a, a, basically a three-month uh, look-see period now extended by about a month, what if 100 percent of the mercury and 90 percent of the particulate 
worked out to be an answer which could be implemented with more available technology today. In other words, what if you could get 99 percent of the benefit, all of the mercury reduction and 90 percent, and I'm using that as a hypothetical figure, of the particulate reduction, and you could get that for a fraction of the cost, let's say uh, one billion in, in, in additional cost, representing only hundreds of additional workers, hypothetically. If that were the case, as an economist, wouldn't you want that cost-benefit looked at? Vast majority of the savings, perhaps in health benefits, 100 percent, because at some point as you reduce particulates, you have a drop-off in the health care benefit improvement. I grew up in Cleveland, a place that all the walls were black. You could see the air when I was a young man. So I am very aware of the improvements made since the 60s. So my question to you is, wouldn't you as an economist want to have that information at your disposal to make a calculation of cost-benefit to the economy on a long-term basis? Yes. I mean, I, the, basically what you are saying is, could we achieve the same goals more productively, less labor needed? I would say in the long run, that sounds exactly right. I would say in the short run, we have a jobs crisis in the country. Everyone agrees with that. And actually, those compliance costs over the next four years represent job-creating investments that will be made that the corporate sector is showing no sign of making any other way. Instead, they are showing signs of sitting on massive amounts of savings without seeing any need to do those job-creating investments. And so that, to me, is why now is the time, assuming we have done all the due, due diligence about whether or not these rules should be done. If that is the case, and it strikes me it is the case, now is the time to do them because it is what will help solve the jobs crisis we have over the next couple of years. Well, I don't know if you were there earlier, but in the earlier testimony, what we had explained to us is there was five years of rulemaking and implementation after the passage of the Clean Air Act in 1990, and there has been as much as a full year for less controversial, less expensive uh, proposed rules. Well, this one enjoyed a roughly three months, now extended by a month. So the question would be, not as an economist, but from a standpoint of wanting to know, if going through nearly a million comments and evaluating those and evaluating the cost-benefit that comes from those suggestions, if that would get you 90 percent for 10 percent uh, and, of course, allow additional technology to get the rest. Wouldn't that be advisable for your finding the optimum benefit to the economy in the way of affordable energy, cleaner air, and, of course, job creation on both sides? Uh, yes, it would be useful to know if that was a, a possible scenario. Well, we hope it is. With that, I recognize the ranking member. I thank the chairman. Um, by the way, Mr. Chairman, um, you had asked earlier whether there was whether there were any coal-fired power plants that might meet this new standard. I think maybe you were out of the room when I entered into the record a list of coal-fired power plants right now that would, in fact, fully meet the standard, including four in my native Virginia, which con contradicts the previous testimony. Um, I now have been corrected. There are actually at least six, uh, the Chesterfield Power Station and the Virginia City plant, both run by Dominion Resources would be fully compliant today. Well, and hopefully the EPA will take and codify that list as, uh, exactly. as exactly that. Yeah. And I appreciate the gentleman. I thank the chairman. And I would also point out for the record that all of the at least six coal-fired power plants in the Commonwealth of Virginia that would be compliant are south of the Rappahannock. They are not in northern Virginia. Um, you don't get to represent them? I don't get to represent them, but uh, attorney, our first witness does. Uh, you may recall his concern for poor communities bearing this brunt. Um, Dr. Bivens, uh, in following up on the Chairman's question uh, about uh, trying to follow testimony, uh, you are now our third witness, and we have had actually three different sets of data in terms of job numbers. Uh, our first witness uh, cited an industry-funded study that uh, claimed that perhaps as many as 180,000 jobs could be lost. Our second witness from EPA said that the midpoint in their analysis was 9,000 jobs would be created. And you just indicated, if I heard you correctly, somewhere between 28,000 and as many as 150,000 net positive jobs created between now and 2015 if this rule were to go into effect. To what do you attribute the variance in these estimates? It is awfully hard as a member of Congress to sort of uh, make the right decision policy-wise with such a wide array of job loss or creation estimates. 
I can speak pretty clearly between the difference between my estimates and EPA. The, the industry-funded study is, is pretty opaque, so I can only guess at what is driving it. So the difference between mine and EPA's is EPA restricted itself to looking only at the likely job impact within the utility sector itself and with one supplying industry, steel, that is going to supply the scrubbers. Um, and I think that they're, they're missing a good chunk of the likely job impacts by not looking at the full range of jobs created by the investments spurred by the need to, to meet the regulatory change. And so that's what my study tries to do. It tries to look at both within the utility sector and outside it, looking at both the positive and negative. Um, the industry studies that, have, that I've seen that have um, chalked up big losses um, regarding this rule, I, I think, make two big common problems generally. Each one is a little different. First one is there seems to be a big discordance between their compliance costs and their price implications. So basically, they have compliance costs um, that look you know, relatively big, say two times as large as EPA, but then they have price spikes that are like four times as large. And given that the compliance costs, that dollar value is the scale of investments that actually support jobs, those should actually move pretty much in tandem with the price increases. Because the only reason you have to raise prices in response to regulatory changes is if you have to hire new people in order to do the stuff that you have to do to comply with the regulatory, uh, new regulatory regime. And so I think they, they have consistently had price increases that are well out of line with the rest of their study actually looks at. And the other thing they don't do, I think, is properly account for the very different macroeconomic environment we're in right now. They basically assume it, it's kind of what would these investments do dropped into the U.S. economy at a normal point in time. We're not at a normal point in time. We've had 9 percent unemployment for three years, even while the Fed's short-term interest rates are stuck at zero in the jargon that's called a liquidity trap. It's a really important context for how the U.S. economy is operating my, right now. My time is limited, so let me ask this question. Thank you. Um, uh, we've heard uh, assertions made that uh, this kind of regulation is a job killer, uh, going to crush industry, going to actually pass on significant costs to consumers. And yet, when one looks at the data of the record of implementation of the Clean Air Act since 1970 and the Clean Air Act amendments since 1990, the data suggests the opposite. I wonder, as an economist, would you comment? I, I agree with that characterization. I would urge people to look at a, a paper my institute did by Isaac Shapiro and John Irons that they looked exactly at that sort of forecast for what regulatory changes were going to do to jobs, price increases, things like that. And consistently, in the end, the, the cost of the regulation was almost always much smaller um, than what was forecast ahead of time. So and I, the price of electricity? Uh, I'm not sure if they looked at price of electricity. I mean, I would say I think the, the best estimate for what's going to happen to the price of electricity is the EPAs, and I see a lot of the other studies out there that look far out of line with that. I, and just for the record, I would repeat, in my native state, the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, since 1990, the, uh, the aggregate uh, or the uh, net cost of electricity has actually gone down by 35.6 percent. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. But uh, if I can ask the gentleman a question about your state. Uh, in Virginia, for those to go down, I am presuming that since it is a rate base on their cost, that in fact that is a matter of efficiency. They're, in order to reduce cost over that same period of time, they produced more electricity at lower cost, uh, where they are getting a return on their capital, a regulated return on their capital. So in this case, where the EPA, by its own estimates, has a cost of implementation, those costs would be passed on. So there would be at least a temporary spike in what otherwise is a cost-benefit reduction that they have been achieving for that period of time. I think the Chairman makes a, a fair point that, obviously, that could happen. I would only point out, though, that contrary to our first witness's testimony, the reason for price spikes in especially rural parts of Virginia has to do with the re-regulation of the industry, a bill that was written by the industry in the General Assembly of Virginia. It had nothing to do with Federal regulation. I appreciate that explanation. And, and I will tell you that as somebody who has seen our State uh, go through deregulation, dramatic reduction in cost, and then blackouts, and we have partial re-regulation, although not complete, it is one of the challenges. Do we give the regulated utilities, and I realize this is, and this is what I am going to ask one last question to the uh, witness, but regulated utilities, when they are given a cost plus situation, they love cost. They often do not complain about cost drivers because they can pass it on, which essentially grows the benefit to their stockholders. Well, at the same time, they will say they want a free market system, 
but not unless it gives them greater profit margins. So uh, I think the gentleman has a good point in your state, as I do in mine. I agree with the chairman. At this point, I should adjourn. <laughs> uh, but I want to thank the witness. Uh, Dr. Bivens, you were very uh, helpful. Your entire statement will be there. Additionally, because you had not as many witnesses, but you had some questions related to some economic hypotheticals that may be beyond what even in your thorough comments you uh, provided, any additional for the next, let us say, seven days, and if you need longer, let us know, we will keep the record open so that anything you believe are missing analysis, either on the upside or the downside, we would appreciate having. Uh, additionally, if you could do me a, a, a personal favor, or the committee a personal favor, to the extent that you could try to deliver us a timeline cost of money, in other words, the cost of a delay, as they just had, of 30 days in the implementation, and the benefit that is potentially there from slight adjustments in the final standard, uh, how you think the parameters of best case of a slight change and worst case of a slight change, because delay has a cost to cleaner air, well, getting it right may have a benefit to lower cost and ultimately greater affordability. I didn't see that in, in your earlier stuff. It is kind of esoteric. But I think for all of us who want to weigh not just on this bill, but in future uh, hearings, do we delay to get it right? What is the cost of delay? Something that, since we are talking about 1990 to till today, I think we have to put in that perspective. And I would yield to the ranking member. Mr. Chairman, I support your request. I think, it's, I think uh, in the endeavor to try to better understand the economics of this, that would be a very helpful contribution. I wonder if the Chairman would also uh, entertain uh, asking Dr. Bivens perhaps to provide a little more analysis on his answer to the question about the job number variation we have heard in this hearing, because we have heard three different sets of numbers. And I, would, I certainly would welcome Dr. Bivens taking some time to help us better understand the different methodologies that led to those different sets of numbers. Absolutely. I thank to you, the, Chair. To the extent that you could, and that was what I, he's, the, the ranking member said it may be more artfully than I did, because we do see where one side is looking at the cost of jobs, higher utility cost and so on, and another side, self-servingly and rightfully so, is looking at the jobs created. And, and obviously, we want to look at the balance, particularly in regulated utility states. I think that the doctor's comments were exactly right on. In a free market regulatory state, this, much of this could re be a compression of profits of the utilities. Well, in those states that are cost plus or regulated, it is going to be passed on. And I think that is one of the things that the ranking member made such a good point of. And with a, an affirmative yes, we stand adjourned.